Hey, I want to start with something today. This is interesting because, well, let, let me get a couple of things out of the way before uh, before I, I, I get to what I want to focus on this segment, which is a a column, interestingly enough, on the Huffington Post. I mean, this is an uber-left website. I mean, they, they talk about me all the time on that website, lampoon, ridicule, and mock the things that I do on this program. Now, they just helped me get the word out. I mean, just the other day, uh, they had featured on their website some video of me talking about how the next domino to fall in the homosexual agenda is polygamy, and, and it was in connection with that news piece from ABC where they were celebrating polyamory, people with m multiple mistresses uh, in the home, and how it spices everything up, and they all join in raising the children. What a wonderful, magical, mystical thing this is. And I said, look, there it is. You know, when we started talking about this years ago, I said, look, if... If same-sex marriage is normalized, if you normalize homosexual behavior, then there isn't any logical place to stop. You will begin to normalize. It's just a matter of time before every sort of sexual perversion is normalized and legalized and has special protections in law. And we predicted that the next domino to fall was going to be polygamy. And sure enough, that's where all the energy is going. you got shows on polygamy on HBO. You have news stories now promoting polyamory, which is the same thing basically as uh, polygamy. And so that's where we're headed. That is going to be the next domino to fall. Then it's going to be pedophilia. So anyway, Huffington Post has repeatedly helped me get the word out. But they've got a piece here that's fascinating to me because it's on the Huffington Post. What people are really thinking when they invite you to church. Now, I saw that heading. What people are really thinking when they invite you to church. I saw that it was on the Huffington Post. And I had a, I predicted in my head what it was going to say. Because this is on an Uber left-wing website. Now, it will surprise you, the content of this piece, and I'd, I'd love to get your reactions to it uh, as the program develops. So hang on to that. I want to get to that in a second. Now, one of the kind of cute things in this whole Christmas business is um, the Republican, the National Republican Congressional Committee. Uh, so this is uh, the, 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 the people that are responsible to get members elected to the House of Representatives. There's a parallel version of this on the Senate side, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, but this is on the House side. They have on their website, well, they had a T-shirt. And on the front, it says, Happy Holidays, in quotation marks. Underneath it, Happy Holidays is what liberals say. And then on the back of the shirt, it says, Merry Christmas. Just kind of a tweak to progressives and liberals. And they sold out of this thing, and it's freaking out liberals all over the uh, fruited uh, plain. So uh, here's how they pitch the T-shirt. Want to really annoy a liberal? Say Merry Christmas. So they love this shirt so much. Happy Holidays is what liberals say. Merry Christmas on the back is what conservatives say. It sold out. Liberals have flipped out, but they are simply going to restock. They're just going to make more. Now, you know, one of the things I've mentioned before is that there is no religious liberty in Islam. That's one of the reasons I do not believe it ought to be uh, normalized or legalized, uh, why I believe we ought to stop the building of mosques in the United States, because under Islam, wherever Islam is in control, there is no religious liberty. This is not, this is a totalitarian ideology. We do not want to let this totalitarian ideology get a foothold in the United States because they won't be content with just a foothold their objective is to grow and expand and take over. And when they do, there simply is no religious liberty in Islam. It does not exist. You convert from Islam to Christianity, they'll cut your head off. So there's no religious liberty. There's not a single church in the entire, in Saudi Arabia. There's a movement now to get rid of all the churches in the Arabian Peninsula, clean them out of churches, no religious liberty. I've always felt, you know, that our, our approach ought to, to this ought to be very simple. It's what Newt Gingrich said a few years ago. We just say to Muslims, hey, you want a mosque in America? Let us build a church in Saudi Arabia. One of ours for one of yours. For every church you let us build in Saudi Arabia, we'll let you build a mosque in the United States of America. That seems to me eminently fair. Anyway, the latest dust-up on this is there, there are Jews that want to pray on the Temple Mount. Now, I've been on the Temple Mount, and I prayed. But you got to be careful how you do it, because if you're too obvious about it, they will come and they will handcuff you and cart you off. And Jews try to do it all the time. They'll drop, they'll drop coins on the, 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 the platform of the Temple Mount and bend down to pick it up and offer a quick prayer while they're there, have other ways of kind of disguising the fact that they're in prayer. Well, the Muslims are absolutely freaking out that Jews want to pray on the Temple Mount. This is the most sacred site in Judaism, 
Now, the Muslims are saying it's their most sacred site, but they didn't, uh, they didn't have any contact with that place. I mean, there is no mention of Jerusalem, for instance, in the Quran whatsoever. A lot about Benita, a lot about Mecca, about Jerusalem, zero, zip, nada, zilch, nothing. It is not one of the holy cities in Islamic theology. It became when they conquered it, and uh, they built a mosque there now. But they don't want Jews even to be able to pray on the most holy site in Judaism, and they're willing to go to war if that happens. So again, no religious liberty in the religion of Islam. And got some Christian colleges. This is hard to believe, but Christian colleges are making prayer rooms for Muslim students. These are Christian colleges, Texas Wesleyan, and the University of St. Thomas, which is a Catholic school. This University of St. Thomas up in Minnesota, they spent 60000 bucks building a prayer room specifically for Muslim students and building these things called wudu stations where adherents of Islam can wash their feet uh, and hands ritualistically. Spent sixty grand uh, on that. So I'd like to know what you think about that. Christian colleges, Christian universities, one of them associated with the United Methodist Church, the other with the Roman Catholic Church, building prayer rooms for Muslims. These, th these are basically idolatrous temples. You set up a prayer room, for Muslims, they are praying to a counterfeit God. They are praying to a false God. It's no different in the days of Judah and Israel when they set up temples to Baal and altars to Baal. It is exactly the same thing. And we know exactly what God thought about all that. Anyway, let's go back to the Suffington Post piece, what people are really thinking when they invite you to church, which can be really annoying. This is a piece by Angela Jameen. can be really annoying when you have zero interest in going to church. Maybe that's why you're reading this. So I said, look, I know people in Huffington Post, you've been invited to church, it bugs you, maybe that's why you're reading this column. You may even be reading this thinking some version of, quote, anyone who would believe in some all-powerful man who watches every little thing that every single person does telling us to love each other while he lets whole nations suffer from starvation and genocide is out of their mind. And she says, that's what I used to think, but I don't anymore. Just over two years ago, I picked up a free Bible. This is on Huffington Post now. I picked up a free Bible. I had read it before, but this time almost instantly in a wave of emotions and realizations and revelations and a wide variety of indescribable sensations, I became a Christian. It happened. It was not deliberate, and it was not a choice. It was what I thought never happened to anyone. It was what I had been so sure did not exist, the way any of these nut jobs described it, but I will be bleep if, I di if it didn't happen to me, I got saved. And she says, I just knew. Like somebody falling in love instantly, they know that's the person they're going to marry. I just knew. And here's what she says. This is what people are thinking when they invite you to church. That's what they want for you. That's what the person that has sent you countless emails and texts about next Sunday or called you every Saturday night asking to pick you up in the morning wants for you. They want, that, they want you to have that intimate relationship with God that they have. Every card from your grandma with Bible passages written on it means she wants this for you. Every flyer from your neighbor or old high school friend about another church event means they want this for you. Every invitation to church is an I love you and I want this indescribable love, peace, and joy for you because I genuinely care about you. And it goes on uh, from there. But she says, look, this is just like that friend that insists you try the new Puerto Rican restaurant downtown. They found something that they like, they love, and they think you will too. And that's what's on the minds of people who invite you to church. They simply want you to know the indescribable peace that they have found in Christ. That's on the Huffington Post, ladies and gentlemen. Back in two.